Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 17. Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 17. The Bible says this, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice than to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is a gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which has already been, and what is to be, has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. Moreover, I saw under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there, and in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time, for there is a time there for every purpose and every work. Hallelujah. Let's pray. God, we thank you tonight, Father, for your presence in this place. Lord, thank you for each and every person here. Lord, that every person here, God, has given their time to come to your house, Father. Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you that we have a place to come and worship. God, that we have the freedom to come and worship. Father, that we have, Lord, the knowledge in our hearts, God, that as we worship, God, as we praise you and meet in the name of Jesus Christ, God, that you are in our midst. And we just pray, Lord, that you bless this time, God, as we give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The name of this sermon is The Mysteries of God. The Mysteries of God. You know why a human being can't rely on intellect to have an intimate relationship with God? A human being cannot rely on the intellect to have an intimate, to have a relationship with God. You know why? Because God is so mysterious that he'll short circuit the human mind. And then I was thinking about this, obviously. I was thinking about, you know, just the mysteries of God. And, and I was just last night, and, you know, I was just sitting, uh, amen, out in my backyard. It was quiet. And just the mysteries of God, amen. And sometimes, I don't mind telling you, uh, the biggest mystery of God in my life is some of my life. Hallelujah. Some of my own life is... is you know, in God is sometimes a total mystery to me. Amen. And I, I was, God, this is such a mystery to me. You know, why, why that, and it's such a mystery. And you know what? The mysteries of God. God's mysterious. And if you try to uh, figure him out, if you try to have a, a, a relationship with him, an intimate relationship with your intellect, you know what? You're going to short circuit. Right? You're going to be like one of those old movies with the, you know, the robots futuristic robots where they had no idea what they were going to look like, and they made them do too much, and all of a sudden, smoke, you know, and uh, sparks and all that stuff. That's what's going to happen to your mind if you try to have an intimate relationship with God uh, and intellect. It's not going to work. Hallelujah. God is mysterious, and He's way beyond our, uh, He's way beyond our ability to understand Him. Amen. There are so many things about him we can't and will not understand until, amen, we're in eternity. But, but, we can have a close, intimate relationship with God 
And we can know and understand things about God. Okay, having, having said all that, he's so mysterious, it'll short circuit your mind. There's so many things that, you know, we can't and will not know about him. Uh, he's mysterious. But you know what? Uh, we can't have a close, intimate relationship with God, and we can know and understand things about God. But not everything. Okay, we can know stuff about God. We can know godly things. But you know what? We can't know everything about God. And so I started pondering that. I started pondering. Okay, I can know things about God. But I can't know everything about God. It says in our text, in verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in their hearts. Except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. And so here, you know, uh, we can know things about God, and we'll look at that. God will give us knowledge. We can know and understand things about God, but not everything about God. So my question was, how are we to know what we can know and understand, and how are we to know what we can't know and understand? Right? I mean, if we can know and understand things about God, but not everything, how are we supposed to know what we can know and understand, and how are we supposed to know what we can't know and understand? And I just stopped thinking like this, okay, I'm done, because you know what? <laughs> The smoke started coming out right about then. Amen. Hallelujah. An intellectual relationship with God can't work because he's, he's, he's mysterious. Hallelujah. And you know, the, the Bible says, uh, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Hallelujah. Amen. That's good to have the revelation of early in Christianity. So after all that, uh, I'd like to start with knowing the things of God. Amen. Now, God is a God of knowledge, okay? Uh, he knows everything. Uh, he knows everything about everybody. All right, I say this quite often. Okay, he, he's a God of knowledge. Amen. There's nothing he doesn't know. Amen. He knows everything about you. He knows things about you that you'll never know. He knows things about you that you don't know yet. Hallelujah. And so, he's a God of knowledge. He's a knowledgeable God. And the good news is, God gives knowledge. Amen. God gives us knowledge. Hallelujah. He's, he's in charge of it. Amen. He's in charge of knowledge. And so he'll, he will give, hallelujah, his people knowledge. It says in 1 Samuel 2, 2 and 3. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly, let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. You know, there's a lot of pride built into intellectualism. You know, there's a lot of pride in people who, uh, you know, we, we have a tendency to call them know-it-alls. That's kind of a, a, a misused saying. A know-it-all is someone who doesn't really know a lot, but talks like he knows a lot. Okay, that's a know-it-all. Okay, that, that has nothing to do with being smart and intellectual. That, to me, uh, I, that's just someone who is, uh, uh, he's not, they're not secure in themselves, and so they need to prove themselves in front of people over and over again. Amen. And so my point is, there, there can be arrogance and pride uh, when, when, there's, when there's a whole lot of uh, intellect going on. It says, talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge. And by Him, actions are weighed. Because He's a God of knowledge. Proverbs 2, verse 6. <clears throat> the Bible says, For the Lord gives wisdom. I'll start in verse 5. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Hallelujah. And so God is a God of knowledge, okay? He knows everything. You know, there are people, you know, thinking that they get away with stuff. Amen. You know what? Uh, we tell our kids all the time, you know, God will find you out. Amen. God will reveal stuff. 
You know, you can fool parents some of the time. Uh, what's that saying? You can fool some of the people all the time. You can fool all the people some of the time. But you can't fool God. I flew that last one in. I don't know what comes after that. But you know, you can't fool God. You just can't. Keep your thoughts as secret as you... You know, He knows you... You can't keep thoughts secret from God. He knows you're going to have them before you even have them. Amen. You know, it doesn't get any more knowing than that. God is a God of knowledge. And I stated earlier, we can know the things of God. Okay, we can. Hallelujah. We can know the things of God. And you know, I dare say, I dare say, that most people, even a cold, the most cold-hearted sinner who doesn't want anything to do with God, if they were uh, given the possibility of knowing a lot of things about God, I believe they would. Not even knowing Him, just saying, hey man, you want to know a lot of things about God? Sure, man. I'd love to know that kind of stuff. You know, whether they believe in Him or serve Him or even want to or not. Because everyone knows that, you know, a godly knowledge, okay, God knows, amen, all, hallelujah, He's a God of knowledge and He gives us His knowledge. We can know godly things. Hallelujah. There's some scriptures here I'm going to go through real quick. Job uh, 19.25 says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand at last on the earth. Okay, I know. Romans 8.28, popular scripture. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 1 John 3.14 We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brethren abides in death. 1 John 3.16 By this we know love, because He laid down His life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Hallelujah. God is a God of knowledge. He knows all, and, and He is a giver of knowledge. Hallelujah. We just ran through some scriptures. We know, I know, and everything after that uh, followed scripture about knowing something godly. Hallelujah. I, you know, I said before I started preaching, you know what, that when I die, I know I'm going to heaven. That knowledge didn't come from any human being. That knowledge came from God. Hallelujah. Knowing the things of God. God is mysterious. Amen. And again, uh, there are some things that we'll never know, but there are some things that we can know. <clears throat> we can know the things of God. I want to look secondly at the reasons some don't know the things of God. The reasons that some people don't know the things of God. You know what? It's a fact that some people don't know the things of God. Amen. And I believe just about everyone in here can name at least one person they know that does not know the things of God. Okay? Because there are some people who don't. Now in my irrelevant opinion, I would say most people don't know the things of God. Amen. How do I know that? Because if more, a lot more people did, uh, there would be more people here. Amen, right? I mean, this and other churches, not just this church. But you know what? If more people knew the things of God, I'm talking intimately, uh, that if there's nothing going on Wednesday night anywhere else, then go where there's something going on Wednesday night. I mean, you, all you have to do is live a little while and know some people, uh, you know, besides saved people, to know that most people don't know the things of God. Now, when a preacher says this, he runs the risk of sounding arrogant to some. Right? Because, I mean, let's face it, me or anyone else standing up here going, you know what? I believe most people don't know the things of God. What I am implying is that I do. I mean, that's, you, you, I can't say most people don't know the things of God without you thinking that I think that I do know the things of God. Right? I mean, so, uh, 
a preacher says that by risking that some may think he sounds arrogant. Amen. But it's not arrogant at all. Amen. If you know the things of God, you know you know the things of God. There's nothing wrong with saying, I know the things of God. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And so I know the things of God. Not everything. Amen. It's good that I don't know everything, because then my mind would short circuit like I was talking about earlier. <coughs> Hallelujah. Now, the fact of the matter is, though, some people don't know the things of God. And there are reasons for this. Amen. There are reasons for this. And we're going to look at a familiar parable uh, that Jesus told, the parable of the sower. And then he explains the parable. And in that explanation, I'm going to read this. And in that explanation, he goes uh, through some of the reasons why people don't know the things of God. Hallelujah. So we look at Matthew 13. I'm going to read the parable 1 through 9. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. The great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So that's the parable. Now he explains the parable, Matthew 13, 18, 18 through 23. Therefore I hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. Verse 20. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of the riches, riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Verse 23, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And so his Jesus gave him a parable to the people and then explaining what it means. Now we'll go over this by the wayside in, in verse 19. It says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Amen. So what this is telling us is, okay, when, when, the, word, when the word was received, uh, there was a seed sown in the heart of that person. In other words, it just didn't go in one ear and out the other. Okay, there was something there uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, allowed the seed uh, of the gospel, of the word of God, to, to be sown in the heart of that person. But you, you see, it said, but it does not understand it, and the wicked one, or the devil, comes and snatches it away. There was no understanding. Okay, it was sown in his heart, but the devil was able to snatch that away because there was no understanding of the word. Now Matthew Henry says this, it is, this is good, it is God's grace that gives the understanding, but it is our duty to give our minds to understand. Right? Okay, God gives the understanding. It's through Him that we understand His word. But none of us can do that without the Holy Spirit. Amen. But, but, we have to give our minds to understand. We have the desire to understand the Word of God. We have the desire to have an understanding so that that seed that's sown in our hearts can, uh, uh, you know, can, can grow. Hallelujah. But someone who has no desire to understand, has no understanding, what was sown in their heart is taken away by the enemy. 
I mean, we've seen it. You've witnessed to someone. Uh, you know, maybe at the door on outreach. Uh, here, I'd like to invite you to church. Slam. You know, or, oh, I'm all set. You know, there's no desire to understand anything about God in that heart. And so even though something can be sown in there, and then it's not going to last, because there's no desire to understand it, and that, that opens the door for the devil to take whatever was sown. Verses 20 and 21, But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. But well, when tribulation or persecution accusion arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And so here's someone that receives the word of God with joy. Amen. You know, either they, people come to church and they hear preaching like they've never heard, and wow, it blows them away. I mean, not everyone gets saved, but you know what? How many people have come back and, uh, you know, wow, there's something different about that. That's what happened to me. Something happened to me the first time I went to a church where salvation abounded. Something happened. I didn't even know what it was. I just had to go back the next, the next week. And I did. Why? Because I, whatever that was, I mean, I knew it was the Word of God. I grew up in, you know, religious Sunday school. I knew the stories and I knew God was real. Amen. But people, a lot of people receive the Word of God with joy. Many are glad to receive God's Word. It helps them in ways that gives them inner joy that has never happened before. Wow, I've never heard this. I grew up in worthless religion. I've never heard the Word of God like this. We hear that quite often. And the Word of God is received with joy. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But it says, tribulation or persecution arises because of the word and immediately he stumbles. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's not rooted. See, after a time, there will be tri tribulation and persecution for everyone that gets saved. Okay, we know that. Preach about that all the time. You know what? Uh, that's reality. That's life. If you become a born-again Christian and you just serve God and you get stronger, amen, and you, you grow in the grace and you grow in the knowledge, uh, and you grow in the power of the Holy Spirit, there's going to be some tribulation and persecution in your life. You know, you can mark that down. You can spend a lot of time running from that. But you know what? If, if you want all of what God has for you, that's what's going to happen. Hallelujah. But because of the persecution and, and, and tribulation, the person stumbles. See, these things, tribulation and persecution, are a test of the sincerity of the person that receives the word. Amen. It's a test. You know, how, how serious were you? I mean, you know, we, we see people pray at the altars all the time. You know, they, they get up, smiling, go their merry way, and just don't even think about changing, don't even care about changing. How serious was that prayer? I dare say not very serious at all. That's why a lot of people must come to the end of themselves. Uh, a lot of people have to come to a place where they got nowhere else to go. And that, that, okay, and listen to me. Uh, when you've tried everything else that the world says you should try to make you happy, when you try everything that your society, your parents, whoever, taught you to try to make you happy when none of it works, okay, you've exhausted every avenue of happiness that you, you know, that you've ever heard of, and you're still empty and lonely and depressed and suicidal, and then you come to God and you feel that joy, you know what, that's serious right there. So a lot of people have to go through that, because otherwise they're not serious about it. And when, there's, when the person isn't serious and genuine, then you know what? Uh, the first time this persecution, wow, I didn't count on this. I'm gone. I'm out of here. This is a little bit too radical for me. I've heard that too. Wow, you guys tell people about Jesus? I can't do that. See ya. Amen. There's no, you know, there wasn't, the, the real, real, genuine sincere, sincerity wasn't there. Because, you know what? Uh, I was received with joy, but with the first pre persecution, amen, it fails. Verse 22, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. 
I don't know if you've ever seen thorns. I grew up calling them briars. You know, but uh, out in the woods, man, you run into them. Uh, it's not pretty. There were some called bull briars. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. Those are the, the thick stem, and the, I mean, they're long. And, and you know, they'll, 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 they'll rip your clothes off, man. If you're running, you don't see them, they'll, they'll take something off. That's, that's what they're talking about here. And, and, and it's like the seed, uh, they, they choke. They choke, uh, thorns will, thorn bushes will choke plants. And it says the cares of this world, because of the cares of this world. <clears throat> See, many people feel when they get saved that, man, it's going to be great now. <clears throat> wow, it's going to be great. Amen. I did this. And you know what? I didn't get in trouble. Now that I'm saved, I'm not going to get in trouble for that wrong that I did. And when they, it catches up to them and they get in trouble, for, well, what's this? I thought I was saved. I thought God was going to get me out of this. And our, there's all kinds of other cares, financial cares, health cares. Anyway, uh, you know, there's all kinds of cares of this world that, that many, many people have the inability to lay down at the feet of Jesus Christ. <laughs> And when you, have, when you don't have the ability to lay, lay down your cares and your fears at the feet of Christ, you know what? Uh, it's going to be like a thorn to your faith and a thorn to your salvation. And it's going to choke it out. It's going to choke it out. Cares of this world. Also the deceitfulness of riches. Hallelujah. Now this isn't necessarily someone having riches. Okay? It's the deceitfulness of riches. Don't make the mistake of looking at this phrase and thinking that, oh, that guy got rich and then he backslid. You know, he thought he was going to be happy with $5 million and he wasn't and he was deceived and now he backslid. You know, it's not talking about just about someone getting rich and backsliding, the deceitfulness of riches. You know, the riches don't even, you don't, you don't even have to have riches to be deceived by them. They don't even have to be yours. You can be, you can be poor as a rock. And be deceived by riches. What does that mean? It, it, you know, like, how about the desire? How about the desire to be rich? How about the desire to have, you know, an easy life? How about the desire for material things? Amen. That, that'll choke out, that'll choke out faith salvation. That'll choke out uh, uh, sacrifice. How many know the sacrifice in Christianity? When you have a desire for riches, when you have a, uh, you know, a desire to have material things, that'll choke out any sacrifice, amen, that'll put those things possibly out of reach. <clears throat> Hallelujah. The promise of riches. I've seen people leave God's will because they're going to make more money. You know, I'm moving. Why? Because I get the job. Where is it? Ah, it's about... It's in northern North Dakota, about a quarter of a mile from the Canadian border. Oh, really, how big's the town? Four people. Don't we have a church there? I bet we have a church there. I'm moving there. I've heard that. No, you know, just, I'm leaving. Now listen. What are you saying? We can't move? What I'm saying is this. I've seen people leave the will of God, whatever that may be, because they're going to make more money somewhere else. That's the sole reason. Without any, without any thoughts about where they're going to serve God. They just go and let the cards fall in place. And I've seen where they never did fall in place. The deceitfulness of riches. I'll be okay. I can still serve God over there. Making five more dollars an hour. I'm not saying you can. Hallelujah. But riches can be deceitful. Amen. And it can choke out the salvation of God. Now, if you look at this passage in Luke, he adds the pleasures of life. Amen. You know, and that, that's a whole sermon. That, that, you know, that's a whole revival services, the pleasures of life. I mean, there's so many of them that stop people from serving God. You know, I'm, I'm not even going to, you know, I can start with A and just go to L and be here till midnight. All the pleasures that take pleasures of life that take people out of the will of God. Amen. And so these are the things that are like thorns. When, when the seed, the seed of God is, the seed of the word of God is so people don't, uh, uh, they don't know the things of God. Bottom line is it's going to be first in your life. 
or you will never know the mysteries of God. So that brings up, lastly, the question, who can know mysteries? Who can know God's mysteries? Well, the bottom line is his disciples. Matthew 13, verse 10, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He didn't say, they didn't say, why do you speak to us in parables? So why do you speak to them in parables? Who's them? The ones that weren't the disciples. Why do you speak to them in parables? Verse 11, Jesus answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Amen. That's what he said to them. Why do you speak to them in parables? Because it's been given to you to know the mysteries. Not them. Not them. They don't know the mysteries. They don't have the understanding. They don't have the desire to understand. They don't have the desire to have the knowledge of God. But you do. And so it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But not to them. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Verse 13 of Matthew 13. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. Seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. The ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their ears that... Yeah, right, how are you going to do that? <laughs> That's a trick. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Hallelujah. See, the bottom line is, who, who can know the mysteries of God? Amen. And it's those who want to know the mysteries of God. Bottom line. Okay, bottom line. Amen. You know, you don't have to be some spiritual guru, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, head of some kind of national monk society sitting up on the mountain. You know, you don't, none of that. None of that. You don't have to be in it. What, what do you got? You got to want it. You have to want it. Amen. If you look around here, uh, there's all kinds of different people in here. And, you know, this isn't that big of a group, right? But you know what? We got all kinds of different folks sitting in here right now. What's that prove? That, you know, it, it, it's a small group to do a, take a poll on. Amen. But you know what? Uh, I believe it's accurate because you go to any church and you're going to see, I won't say any church, but you go to a lot of churches and you'll see just a diverse, diverse group of people. And what that tells you is it doesn't matter who you are. If you want it, you can have it. If you want to know the mysteries of God, you can know the mysteries of God. You want a hunger for the mysteries of God? Amen. A, a genuine desire? You can have them. Now again, don't use, use your intellect because you can know some of God, but not all of God. And as I asked earlier, how do you know well, uh, what are the things you can know and understand? And how do you know what the things aren't that you can understand? You know, don't get all wrapped up like I do before I shut my mind off and just pray. Amen. You get too confused to shut your mind off and pray. You can't figure it out. Just stop trying and pray. Hallelujah. Get in the spirit. Amen. Because the spirit gives understanding. The mind doesn't. <clears throat> Luke 8.15 He ends this parable like this. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who, having heard the word, with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. King James Version says, an honest and a good heart. So if someone hears the word, amen, they have a noble or, or, or honest and a good heart, they will keep it and it will bear fruit with patience or endurance. Amen. You know, this is why the, a lot of times people judge folks who come into church. You know, or like, like that, that chick trap, bad bomb. You know, bad bomb. This big old ugly, awful biker. Amen. You know, and... Uh, and you know, 
doesn't matter what they look like, doesn't matter what they talk like, doesn't matter what they smell like, doesn't matter, you know, what they think like. <laughs> Hallelujah. What matters is do they have a desire, amen, to know God and to know the mysteries of God? Well, if they do, they can. Hallelujah. That's why there must be conversion. Genuine conversion. See, we believe in that. you got to have conversion. Amen. you got to have an outward conversion. People's good. You know, obviously inward. But there has to be a change that people can see if there's real conversion. Right? I mean, so, someone can be a, you know, a 12-pack-a-day, a half a bottle of whiskey a day drinker and say they're converted, but if they're still drinking uh, whatever I just said, uh, there's no conversion there, right? I mean, the inward conversion has to come to the outward or it's not conversion. People have to see it. Amen. That's why, you know what? Whoever wants to, whoever has a genuine desire to know the mysteries of God can know the mysteries of God. Proverbs 2, I'm going to read 1 through 9. As I begin to think about almost maybe closing. <coughs> my son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice to understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of God and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice, preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity in every good path. Hallelujah. See, it's unfortunate that what we're involved in, we see more people get saved than actually live a life to serve God. Right? We see people get saved that don't aren't serving God right now. Now, percentages, I don't know. I don't, don't want to know. But, uh, and the reason is because of some of these, these things I preached about tonight. <coughs> You know, they, whatever, you know, I'm not going to go over all that. But it, it you know, it, it, it saddens us when someone comes and genuinely saved and saved, but because of all these other things in life, uh, it gets choked out. Amen. They allow the devil and they allow the things of this world to, to take away the seed that was sown in their hearts. So if I have to end this sermon on two words uh, this evening. Those two words would be the end. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> those would be two good words to end it on. But those two words that don't settle. Okay, don't settle. Don't settle for some. You know, don't even settle for most. I, I couldn't do that. You know what? And, and believe me, this is coming from someone who settled for some all his life, except when I got saved. When I got saved, it was the first time I didn't want to settle for less. I, I've always settled for less because it was easier. Life's easy when you don't have to try, right? I mean, it catches up to you as you get older, and there are regrets and all, you know, a whole bunch of junk. But my two words is don't settle. And don't settle for part of God. Don't settle for part of what he has for you. Don't even settle for most of what he has for you. Get, get all of it. Man, get all of it. Don't, don't go partial. Amen. You know, don't, 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 don't be a convenient Christian. That's lukewarmism. And we all know what God says about the lukewarm. Hallelujah. But want it all. Man, there's mysteries. There's things that God has. There's a mystery that, there's mysteries. God has your name on it. He wants to show you. Your name's on it. Okay, mystery. Okay, when they're ready, I'm going to send them this. This mystery. And they're going to, it's going to freak them out. And they're going to show people. And it's going to, it's going to give them joy that I show them. You know, and, and on and on and on. How many mysteries are, you know, in the, in the mystery closet in heaven with your name on it? 
you know, ready to send, you know, the spiritual uh, messenger dove or whatever those things are called. Carry a pigeon. Messenger dove. Hallelujah. There's mysteries with your name on it. Don't, don't, don't leave them up there. Okay, don't get up to heaven, you know, by the skin of your teeth and see all these mysteries that had your name on it. Man, I could have had all those. Hallelujah. The mysteries of God are for us to know. Amen. For us to know and for us to teach. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads.